what led me to the field of study was a sighting I had in 19, May of 1975. Uh, it was a small town in Canada. I live in Canada. Had sightings almost nightly. I said to my friends, let's go see what they're looking at. I had no interest in extraterrestrials. I was interested in paranormal phenomena, not interested in extraterrestrials. Eventually we went out. There was a, a TV crew that actually caught this thing on the ground. When that happened, I said, let's go. Let's go see what they're looking at. And the way I explain it is, it's like you buy the lottery ticket. You know there's a chance you're going to win, but you're not going to win. I'm not going to see anything. We were out there an hour. We were about to come home. It was a waste of time. We turned to go back in this small town one more time to come back, and it appeared from the left to the right, and everybody said, there it is. Everybody instinctively knew this is what it was. The rest of my friends went on with their life. I fell off the edge of the earth. I, I could not believe what I'd seen. I was just absolutely floored. It looked like it was alive. It was glowing. It was a plasma red object, very low to the ground, very in close to the car. This is not a light in the sky. It was in very, fairly close. I was absolutely fascinated. I dragged all my friends out there. And um, the second night, it came right at us. My friends had left. They said, we're going home. Second night, it came right at me. And then I was really hooked. And since then, I have tried to figure out what is the answer. I tried to publish a book about this small town in the 1970s. Nobody would publish the book. One publisher says to me, Mr. Cameron, you may believe in this kind of stuff. Count me among them believers. And I was horrified. I thought, well, this is a waste of time. So all I was interested in starting in May of 1975 is somebody has to know what this is. I don't know, but somebody has to have the power, the, the insight to know what's going on. So I spent the, basically the rest of my life just trying to figure out what was it I saw that night in May of 1975. I have great empathy for people who don't believe, who go about their life and aren't interested in the subject, because if I had not seen anything in 1975, I wouldn't have been interested either. Uh, I just tell my story, um, and I think that's what it basically comes down to, is everybody tells their story, and it's like they said, uh, new, um, new ideas aren't um, created it just goes through a number of funerals that you basically, as the young generation comes along, it becomes more and more acceptable, which is verified by my experience. In 1975, this was a taboo subject. It is no longer a taboo subject anymore because so many people have talked about it. And the more people talk about it, the more the consciousness rises and the more it becomes acceptable. I, I never really tried to convince anybody. I just told my story and um, people would just sort of look the other way, you'd go to a cocktail party, you'd start talking, and one person would be interested, they'd know I'm into it, they'd talk to me, and I could actually see the people moving to the other side of the room. So I knew that people weren't, but I always had this empathy that if I hadn't had this sighting, I probably would have been there as well. So that's all I've really done is tell my story, and um, I've got the second story that I have is my consciousness story, where, and then the people really started to flock away from me. Because then it was like, this guy's lost it, he's gone new age. Because what I had done in 1975 is I went saying, sightings are a total waste of time. You're not going to learn anything by watching stuff fly around this guy. And I went after the government. I went after the Canadian government. I went after the former president of Penn State University who knew what was going on. He led me to the president of the United States. I was at the National uh, an Archives, the Truman Library. And it was at that point I said, the president's got to know. The president's got to know what's going on here. He's the most powerful guy in the world, supposedly. And so I spent about 20 years chasing around the president of the United States. Came to the conclusion the president knows what's going on, but he's not going to tell you. It was at that point I had what I refer to as a download experience. I was watching Colin Andrews, the famous crop circle researcher. Didn't want to be in the room. Was an interest in crop circles. I just went because he was a highly respected researcher. While I was in the room, I had a download experience. It happened instantaneously. It happened, it was three pieces of a puzzle. Things that I had already researched through my career, and all it did was take the three pieces of the puzzle, put them together and say, this is how it works. And the answer was that it's consciousness. The, the non-local consciousness is how you figure this thing out. That happened February 26, 2012, and since that happened, the lights came on, it was like I had glasses, I could read the signs, everything started to make sense. And it's gone even to this last week, where I have a very high level person in Hollywood. Very high level, we're going to try to hide his name as long as we can, who is a full-blown experiencer. He has these things in his house, above his house. 
His family, very, very powerful family in Hollywood, thinks he's sort of lost it. He came to me because of the consciousness thing. This thing's interacting with me. Am I crazy? What's going on? So I said to him, I said, this thing is interacting with you. You can talk to it. Ask it something. Demand answers. And what he said was, okay, if I'm dealing with an extraterrestrial or whatever this is, put something in my head that I don't know. And what they put in his head, and it was in his own voice, he said, I heard in my head the word biocentrics. And he said, what the heck is that? And he went home and he Googled it. And it's based basically on a book by Dr. Robert Lanza, very prominent biologist considered by the New York Times, one of the top three scientists in the world. And he writes this book called Biocentrics, which basically says consciousness is primary. Life creates the universe, not the other way around. Nothing is random. And this is this high level scientist writing this book. So when he told me this story, I went and got the book and I went, oh my God, that's the same download I got. Consciousness is primary. This is what it's all about. And he had gotten it through his, I'd got it through this download experience. And it's been that kind of world since 2012 that basically I say consciousness, the idea of non-local conscious, understanding what it is and the fact that it's not a material world, consciousness is primary, these kind of ideas. Once you understand that, the UFO subject starts to make an awful lot of sense and you can understand how they get here, how they're interacting with people and what is going on. As long as we are in a situation where we believe it's a material world, everything is random, we are never going to solve the UFO subject. So since 2012, it's just been like lights on the entire time. It's all sort of made sense. And so that's what I say. It's basically this, this concept that as with quantum physics in the early 100 years ago, the particle does not appear on the back wall until there's an observer. Observer is primary, consciousness is primary, matter is secondary. Consciousness creates the physical world. And it's that kind of idea that opens up a lot of answers for the, for the, for the UFO dilemma. But what happened then is when I made that consciousness thing, then the U basically a lot of the UFO community just basically backed off and said, he's, he's lost it. I mean, he's just, he's gone woo woo. And, and I said, I didn't really choose to do this. I was dragged there. I mean, I, I had this experience. It happened. It came with absolute certainty, which is very hard to, for people to understand. It said, basically, you don't have to figure this out. This is how it works. And it was absolute certainty. People can say, I don't believe it. I say, I know this is how it works. It, it came with that absolute certainty. So these three pieces of the puzzle came in my head. And I spent almost every minute since then working on the subject of consciousness and people who are interacting with the UFO phenomenon. That's the experiencers. So what I say is you can't learn anything by watching stuff fly around in the sky except to say, yeah, it's pretty unusual and we probably didn't build it or, uh, you know, doing government documents, stuff like that. It's not until you talk to the experiencers, the people who are interacting with the intelligence behind the phenomena that you start to learn. And a lot of these people are on that wavelength. They'll tell you it's consciousness. They'll tell you it's all telepathic. And uh, so for me, I'm very confident in, in where I am now and where I'm going in terms of answering that question. That was a question I had in May of 1975. Somebody has to know what's going on here. And I think I have a pretty good answer of exactly what's going on. Okay, the, the, the importance of consciousness is the we're making the assumption that they uh, are flying through space, that they're aliens in little tin cans flying around. And basically, the more you look at the UFO phenomena, the more you realize it's going to be a lot less physical than you think it is, and it's going to be a lot more spiritual than people think it is. It's almost like the CIA refers to it as phenomenology. So they have a desk, it's called the weird desk at the CIA. And it's not just UFOs. People think, well, they're working on UFOs. No, it's not. It's UFOs, remote viewing, psychic phenomena, telekinesis. It's all ghosts, mediums, channelers. It's all the same thing. Everything in the world is consciousness. And it's just different, almost like I described the analogy as water. So if you're at the bottom, if you're on physical consciousness, you're down at the bottom 10,000 leagues under the sea. It's all dark. You really don't know what's going on. But the more you can disassociate from this physical consciousness and move up 
through the water, the brighter it gets, the more you, you can see until you get. And all the people, whether it's a channeler, whether it's a UFO experiencer, whether it's a medium, all they're doing is disassociating. They're disassociating and they're moving up in the water and they're able to see things and they're able to bring stuff back. So in terms of experiencers, we know that there are, there's a group called the Free Foundation, the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Experiences. It was started by Edgar Mitchell and uh, a guy by the name of Ray Hernandez. And they've talked to 4,000 experiencers, made them fill out these 600 questions and they've all filled out these questions. And some of the things we learn there show quite clearly that consciousness is key. 42% of all experiencers, people who claim that they're experiencers who've interacted with the phenomena, believe they have scientific, technical, or, or, or mathematical material in their head that they did not learn in school. So they're getting this from somewhere. They're pulling it from somewhere. They didn't learn it. The other big stat they have is at one point during their experience, the people who answered the question, 40% of all the, the experiencers said, at one point during their abduction or their in interaction with the intelligence, at one point during that thing, they knew the answer to everything in the universe. That's higher self. That is tapping in. That's getting to the top of the water where you can actually see the sun. And so that's what this, this whole thing is. UFOs is no different than any of the other paranormal phenomena. It's just this ability to dissociate. So when I started looking at this download experience, I started to look at other people who had download experiences and I got into musicians. Lots of musicians are into UFOs. Lots of them are experiencers. I looked at artists. I looked at people doing psychedelics. I looked at near-death experiences. And it's all the same thing. And what I said, what it is, is your brain has two sides, right and left. Your left brain is your rational, analytical, uh, ego brain. And the right brain is the one that can tap into the universe, into this, this field. And what, so what it is, whether it's remote viewing, whether it's hypnosis, whether it's uh, channeling, it's all the same thing. It's the ability to, they say quiet the mind, but it's not quiet the mind. It's the ability to shut down the left rational analytical ego brain. Shut off that voice and you just disassociate and you pop out and you're able to, whether it's talk to dead people, uh, talk to aliens, and even there's a famous channeler by the name of Bashar who's in LA and uh, does this channeling. A lot of people will say, with their experience, I, have, I, have, I don't think I've been on a ship, but I, I get all these dreams. And Bashar says, we come to you in your dreams because now you're in our world. And that's what it is. They're in that higher consciousness. They can come down into the physical world. They can interact with us. They can go back up. And we are in this illusion world. We would think we're here. We're stuck here. There is no out there out there. There is an out there out there. And it's not levels, but it's just like a, a higher, whether you get a higher frequency, more dissociation, the more you can dissociate from your, get that, shut down that ego mind, the more you can tap into that field. So it, it's very encouraging in terms of uh, getting answers. And a lot of people in the UFO field will say, experiencers, well, they just believe, they have, they believe that they've got these experiences. They believe they've been on the ship. And I say, yeah, yeah, sure, they believe they've been on the ship, but you believe you're a skeptic. You believe this isn't true. It's all Kool-Aid. It's all belief. I'll agree with you. It's all belief. But if you have 40% of these experiencers who say at one point during their experience, they knew the answer to everything in the universe, don't you think you should talk to these people? Give them lie detectors. If only 10% of these people are telling the truth, that's a huge uh, field that you can pull material, you can learn stuff from there. And so the whole idea is that everything is consciousness. All the answers are there. It's the Akashic record idea where all the material is there and it's the ability to dissociate and pull it back. And that's what experiences are doing. When they're having the experience on board the ship, they're being forced to dissociate. They're in that dream world. They're in that, they're being taken out of their body or even when they're physically, but a lot of them are taken out of their body, like, like an out of body experience. They're in that world. And that's when they get these downloads. That's when they get these, uh, these answers to different things. They get messages and stuff like that. And so I say it's critically important because that's what you want to do. You want to find out what is, this, what is this intelligence that we're dealing with. You have to interact with it. And the best way to interact to it is disassociate from the material world. The problem is that the, the, the world today is based upon science. It's based upon a materialistic paradigm. And if you say, it's not a material world, it's not random, you're considered to be woo-woo, and because people in the UFO community are so sensitive 
about their about the way they are. I don't want people laughing at me. They play the game. Well, we're going to go along with science. We're going to measure this thing. We're going to do the physical thing and stuff like that. And it's like you're wasting your time. We've done this for 70 years now. It's a total waste of time. You you haven't learned anything in 70 years. You've got to stop this material thing. There's a group now to give you an idea. There's a group now called To the Stars Academy, which is this Tom DeLonge group. The guy who runs it, his name is the director is a guy named Jim Semivan. He ran covert ops for the U.S. CIA for two years. He was with the CIA for 25 years. He was very high level when he left. Jim Semivan had an experience when he was in the 1990s. He had the beings in his room with his wife. Then he remembered standing in his pajamas and this thing was flying away outside. He said, when, I, when that experience happened, he said, my, my idea of reality was shattered. This is this whole material paradigm sort of shatters. And his expression in a, in a forward he wrote for Tom DeLonge's book, he says the following. He says, the idea that you can measure this thing, which is the scientific method, it's all physical, we can measure it, we can do all this kind of stuff. The idea that you can measure this thing is laughable. How do you define something when there does not appear to be any there there? This has got to do with consciousness. This has got to do with multidimensionality, which is beyond the present understanding of our science. So consciousness is the Rosetta Stone. Once we get that, then it starts to make sense as to what this intelligence is, what they're doing, and how we can interact with it. I don't know if it's spiritual, it was very dramatic. I mean, for two days, I, I just wandered around. I've had a second download experience, which goes to the same sort of field. I had, and I really haven't talked to him about it too much. It was more complex. It was 24 items that came to me. I'm walking down the street. I live in the coldest city in the world. This is not the middle of winter, but it was cold. I had to take off my glove. This stuff was coming into my head. And it came, it came with this certainty. It was like, you gotta write this down. You gotta, you gotta record this. And I'm sitting on a piece of paper and I'm writing this thing. And what I got there was the idea that we're making mistakes in how we view the world. That's all it is. It's not anybody's right or wrong. It's just, you make certain mistakes that are wrong, for example. You say it's a material world, that everything is built out of, the universe is built out of little nuts and bolts. And that's not true. It's consciousness. Consciousness creates matter. So that was the one thing. So it's these comparisons. The other one was, if it's one life, then it's one world. If it's multiple lives, if reincarnation is a fact, everything changes, especially in the UFO field. If it's reincarnation, then you may be coming in here, people say, I was abducted, they took me against my will. If it's a multiple life scenario, you may have chosen to do this. You chose to come here to go through this thing to help whatever this intelligence is to raise consciousness of the earth. So I had these 24 things that came to me, all these sort of uh, things that you're, you're just picking something wrong, you're making these false assumptions about how the world actually works. And once you get the assumptions right, and that's where this Biocentrics book comes from, this Robert Lanza book, he absolutely goes chapter by chapter and I was just, when I saw the book, I went, wow, it's exactly the same thing. He, he does a whole chapter on randomness, which I'm going to be talking here at Contact in the Desert. Randomness. Is the world random and meaningless, all just background noise, or is it pattern? Is it following a pattern? And if you believe it's random, then you, you make a lot of mistakes. If you believe it's pattern, then you sort of realize that the aliens are going through this sort of pattern. It's actually something is happening. It's, it's making sense. It's not like you and I are having this interview and the idea in modern science is that we didn't choose to have this interview. The Big Bang happened, the dice started to roll, and you have no, you have no free will. You have, consciousness is an illusion, and that you just are here because of something that happened at the time of the Big Bang, which is like total nonsense. So you, if you assume that it's a pattern world, the universe is alive, as, as, as uh, Biocentric says, life creates the universe. Life can learn. It's, it's, it's patterning, it's learning, it's developing, and then you, you have a, a, a better understanding of, of what this is all about. The, one of the most significant things ever to happen in the UFO field just happened in the last year, and that is the New York Times, Washington Post, and Political, three newspapers, all at the same time, ran the same day with a major UFO story, which is significant because the New York Times, Washington Post, and Political don't do UFO stories. And they all did it the same day, which means this was planned. This was somebody in behind the scenes who got them to do it. And I say it's the government. I wrote a book called Managing Magic. And I say the government has been doing this for 70 years. 
but this time it looks like they've put some steroids in the water. They've actually started to move this thing along. And I talk about 1970s, uh, they did it with a producer by the name of Robert Emenegger, a guy working for Ad Grey Advertising in Los Angeles. They ran a program where they did a UFO documentary where he was given access to a bunch of material. They did it in the 1980s with Bill Moore, with a bunch of government officials that came to him. They've been doing this program over and over again, gradually leaking different concepts like Area 51, the live alien at Area 51, the crash at Roswell. All these things are basically coming through these leaks, through these, these, these various people. And what has happened now is that um, they have gone with this, this uh, Tom DeLong set up a platform for them so they could operate. And they are using his ability to get to his, all his Twitter followers. He's a very prominent guy, he sold 30 million albums. His Facebook site, he has a lot, of, a lot of traffic. And he said, you're trying to get this message out to the young people and you're messing it up. They're not listening to you. I can help you. And so they decided we'll go along with this. And so what they are doing is what they've been doing all along is leaking material into the UFO community. And the main thing that they leak, which is very significant, and they got away with it. And that was that it was always sort of rumored that when the government finally says it's for real, that everybody's gonna go like, you, you people lied and there's gonna be people very angry. And that's exactly what they did. They went in December and they basically said, it's for real. The government is investigating. We spent $22 million. We had this program, they probably got a lot more programs, but they, they outed the one program. They said, we got this program. And basically they said, we lied, we do have a program, UFOs are real, and they, they put it out, and nobody panicked. It just, it just went along, and I would say that 5 10% of the population of the United States probably shifted at that moment. Because the way it works, if you're trying to get the story out to the, to the, to the public, I say it works like, like an election. If you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat, I'm not going after your people because they're not going to vote for me. And you're not going after my people because they're not going to vote for you. You go after the swing voters. So what you have is a bunch of people in America who are sitting on the fence say, oh, I really don't know. Suddenly the New York Times puts it out. And when the New York Times puts it out, suddenly it's okay. Everybody starts talking about it. And so you get this shift. So what they're doing is you're shifting the consciousness of people. So very, very significant. And we'll see where it goes. They have more stuff. I, you know, I've heard various rumors about seven-year program and stuff like this where they're putting it out. And the important part is uh, that the government is approving this, this material. This is not a bunch of rebels who, you know, have decided they're going to run around and, and get stuff. These, these videos, these documents are coming from the government. So the government is trying to get the, the, the program out, which is very significant. They've been trying to do it for many, many years, almost if, since day one. The, the first sighting ever took place was, was uh, Kenneth Arnold, June the 24th, 1947. He was given photographs as well. He was given photographs by the 4th Air Force and told these are U real UFOs. So in the, in the disclosure world, and this applies to the aliens as well, I say there's, th there's, there's three things, three possibilities. The government is disclosing, and they're not disclosing full disclosure, because if they wanted to disclose, they would stand the President of the United States up and the president would say, it's for real, here's the bodies, here's the crafts, show them all the pictures. So they're not disclosing, they're not doing full disclosure. They're not doing, they're not covering up, because if they wanted to cover up, they would do, I'm from Canada. I don't know what the Canadian government's doing, because they don't talk about it. If you wanted the story to go away, you just shut up and quit talking about it. You wouldn't keep leaking documents, giving stuff to Tom DeLong. so they're not, they're not covering up. So they're not disclosing, they're not covering up, they're doing something in between. They're doing this gradual disclosure, and the intelligence man, the phenomenon, is doing the same thing. If they wanted us to know who they were and all the mystery, they would land on the White House lawn and tell us what's going on. So they're not disclosing either, but they're not covering up. Because I always tell people, why do UFOs have lights on them? So you can see them. We don't have lights on our planes, so why do UFOs have lights? So you can see them. They want you to see them. So they're, they're, they're not covering up. They've got the lights on. They're, they're contacting people. They're giving people messages and stuff. They're doing something in between as well. So they're both doing this gradual climatization of the people. And what they did in December was the first step. So it's not full disclosure. It's what's called confirmation. The guy who's the, got the material, the most of the material is Bob Bigelow, this billionaire aerospace guy from Las Vegas. He sort of controls all the material that, that was done through this program. 
He did an interview in 2013, and in that interview, he was asked, are you in favor of disclosure? And he said, no, I'm not. He said, what we need is confirmation. We just need confirmation. We need to tell the American people that this phenomenon is real and stop right there. That's exactly what they did in December. Exactly. They said, UFOs are real. We have this bizarre phenomena. It could be Russian, could be Chinese, but we don't think so. It's a mysterious phenomena, but it's not alien. We're not saying it's alien. We're not saying it's ET. And that's what he said. Stop right there. You leave that down the road. You can tell, talk about what this thing is. You start from the very beginning. We have a phenomena. It's unknown and we're working on it. Well, they've been, they've been doing it for, for many years. I think Tom DeLong gave them the opportunity when he set up this, uh, the platform. He was such a, a big name where he could come out and, and really move a part of the population. So I think that's why they, the Tom DeLong was the key to the whole thing. But as I said, they've been doing this all the way through, all the way through the years. They, they went to Walt Disney. It's a famous story. They went to Walt Disney. He did a documentary in 1956. And at the end of the documentary, they were going to give him video, they were going to give him uh, photographs, just like Tom DeLong. and at the end they pulled, they pulled the stuff, they said, oh, we can't do it, there's been a change, we can't, and he did the documentary anyway. Same thing happened to Bob Emenegger in 1974 from Richard Nixon. They gave him and they talked about a famous film, it's called the Holloman Air Force Base film. And he was told it was filmed in May of 1971 at Holloman Air Force Base, a top secret base. And what happened was there's three cameras on the ground, one in the air, this UFO lands and it's filmed by the American government. And so Bob is given this documentary to do. He's able to walk in the Pentagon without signing in. He can talk to anybody he wants on any Air Force base. And then they say, we're going to give you this film. And we're going to, you can use this film, you can put it at the end. And just like Disney, at the end they said, oh, it's the Watergate. The time isn't right, we have to pull the film. And they pulled the film but then in the documentary, which was called UFOs Past, Present, and Future, they put eight seconds of the film in there. So I said to Bob, I said, Bob, you told me they'd sent the film back to the Pentagon. He said, well, they did. And I said, but Bob, there's eight seconds of film in the documentary. And he said, well, that was just background. And I said, what do you mean that was background? And he said, well, it didn't show anything. And what it does, it's not when the craft gets on the ground and you can see the craft for real and the aliens getting out, it's the craft as it's coming over the mountains. They show eight seconds of this craft coming into the base over top of the mountains and they put that in the film. So this is how they're doing it. It's this gradual thing and what you do is you put the carrot out, you pull it back. You put it out, you pull it back and you just slowly move the population down the road because the, the problem is that it's fine to say on the outside we should have disclosure, but if suddenly you're the president and you're the person that's going down if this thing goes bad, if this goes south, so everybody's scared. So they, they, once you spill the milk out of the glass, you can't put it back in the glass. So that they're being very cautious, they're moving it very, very slowly. They want to make sure that everything they do is right so that it doesn't get out of control. Because if it gets out of control, they could have a lot of trouble with how many lies they've told, possibly people that have been killed. Uh, all the stuff that's happened over 70 years. So that's what I think they're doing. And Tom DeLong provided them this platform that has worked very, very well. I mean, this has, has really accomplished more in the last six months than happened in the first 70 years. Some people are ready. I, I say everybody's at their, their own level. Um, some people, there's even a story like people will say, uh, why doesn't the government disclose? And I say, because you, you got to realize the government is not the government. Every assumes it's like the government does this. And, and if you take a look at Congress right now and you see it's totally divided, you, that's the way the government is. It's these people fighting against each other that, that so I wanted out because I'm Jim Semivan. I had an experience. I'm one of the other guys who've had an experience. I want this out. I want to find out what's going on myself. So they're very much ready for this thing. Some of the government people will say, well, you know, I really don't know, whatever, let it go. But then you have a group. And they talk about this, Lou Alessandro talked about this, that one of the biggest problems they had in the program being shut down in 2012 was the religious element inside the American government. There are people who inside the American government who believe this is demons. And we are not going down this road. So you got to realize the government is not the government. It's, it's the, the people who are for it, the people who are dead set against it. And there's this battle inside the government, everybody playing their cards, trying to get this story out. Well, I, I think what they're doing now is, is, is works very well. And there was one of the guys who ran the weird desk at the CIA. He told this story. He said, he was interviewed and he said, what would you do if you had this problem? 
Well, what you'd do is you'd put all these stories, the aliens are eating our kids and all this kind of stuff, and the people go, wow, 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 and, and you leak this stuff into the, into the public. And then when it comes out, if it suddenly leaks out, then it's, oh, there's, eat, there's extraterrestrials visiting. And then people go, what, they're not eating our kids? No, they're not eating our kids. Well, what's the big deal? And so they're playing these kind of games where they're leaking stuff and they're sort of playing with people. But I think basically the best way is for people just to talk about it, to put it out there, and every time people talk about it, it's, it's almost like the idea of African Americans. How did African Americans get rights? It wasn't because somebody in Washington signed an agreement and said, we got to do this. It was lots of people pushing, 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 and the consciousness rose to a certain point, and then it flipped. The same as gay rights, the same as gay marriage. It wasn't like one day to say, well, when was, when was uh, gay, gay rights? What, what, when did they get disclosure? When did they get their day? And you go, well, I don't know what it was. And that's what it is. It's a slow process that just suddenly flips and suddenly everybody just goes along with it. They say, oh, if the, gay, the guy's gay, who cares? And that's the way it works. It's, you're doing that, that sort of thing rather than throwing it in people's face and saying, this is what it is. So that's what they're doing. They're trying to slowly raise the consciousness to the point where everybody just says, eh, ET's big deal. I mean, what's the big deal? Why, what's the big, and that's what they're, what they're planning to do. And then they can bring out the other aspects. The aspects I would have problems with is what's happened is that the way it works now is that the Defense Department is the only one with money. So if you want to do UFO research, you have to go to the Pentagon. Because anybody else, if you go to any other government in the agency, they'll go, who cares about extraterrestrials? Who cares? I mean, like, we don't, we're not interested in that. But the Defense Department, and that's why they call it the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, if you call it a threat, then you can go to the Pentagon and say, this could be a threat. These guys could be bad guys. And then they go, okay, we'll give you some money. And that's the way, that's the way I think they've done it, which has, a, which has a sort of a back end to it, a bad side to it, in that we may actually get stupid enough to think that we're going to try to shoot these things down or start a war or something like that, because that's the way a, a military person thinks. Everything's a threat. Uh, this person's a threat, that, and you're always looking at everything as being a threat, because that's your job, is to protect the United States of America. And that's the problem I see that may arise from this whole thing, is that we're going to build them into a threat, which is what Werner von Braun apparently warned. He said, first they're going to use uh, terrorism, and the final thing that they're gonna to use to build a military industrial complex is the alien invasion. And that's what I'm sort of a little bit afraid of, that they're going to try to build this thing as a threat. They've been asked, actually asked, is there a threat? And they'll say, no, as far as we know, there isn't, but you never know. So they keep the option because if they say it's not a threat, all the money disappears. Nobody's going to fund it unless you have a need. You need in order to get a, a, something funded, you need a need. And the biggest need is these could be evil aliens. What led me to this thing? How did I get started in it? And I got to be honest with you, in my case, I think I was just born this way. I mean, I always had this curiosity about aliens and alien life and space. As far back as I can remember, my, my earliest memories are of watching Gemini and Apollo missions being launched on television at home, you know, before I was even old enough to go to kindergarten. And it was truly amazing stuff. So I've had this fascination my entire life. I didn't, I didn't start watching Lost in Space and Star Trek and then get interested in space and aliens. I was already interested, which is why I watched Lost in Space and Star Trek and all that stuff. So it just, I, I just have to tell you, I think I was born that way. There was no real influence. My dad was an engineer at Boeing, but he wasn't working on the space program. He was working on commercial jets, which were not that fascinating to me, although I ended up doing that for a living too. It kind of runs in the family, I guess. Of course, sort of bad gallbladders, but um, sorry, I probably won't use that. Probably won't use that, will you? But no, there was no major influence in my life th this way. I, I really think it's like a sole purpose. It's something that I was just sent here to do or chose to do, and here I am. I remember watching a Gemini Titan launch on TV, black and white TV, and it was one, I forget, I think it was either Gemini 6 or 7, where the rockets on the launch pad, they count all the way down, the engine starts and runs about two seconds, and then they cut it off. So it started and it stopped. And I remember that very distinctly. I can still see it in my head. So that was pretty much the earliest memory about space and aliens and all that stuff. It was watching 
our space program and the incredible stuff that was being accomplished by the guys at NASA. It was exciting because the, one of the things about it that was exciting is, oh, this, this could go wrong. It's not automatic. I mean, something could happen. And so that made it more dramatic and it made what the astronauts were doing more courageous. So it made them into bigger heroes to me. So I was like, wow, this is, this is kind of dangerous. You know, something bad could happen. I don't think I understood the concept of death, but I certainly understood that, that a rocket could blow up. So. Where that came from, I, gosh, I don't even know. JFK was actually the central figure in the disclosure and of UFO information. I mean, he was definitely going to tell people about what was really on the moon, what was really on Mars, what we had found, and what he already knew. He, he, he knew back, at least as far back as the post-war era, right after the war, that there were aliens and they had visited the Earth and that they had, we'd had interactions with them because he was very close friends with James Forrestal who was the first director, first Nash, uh, defense secretary of the United States, and was also a member of this MJ-12 organization, which was a secret organization inside the government that actually dealt with aliens and the UFO question, and what are we gonna do about this? So Kennedy knew him very well. In fact, he went to the point that in 1963, the year he was assassinated on Memorial Day, after he gave his speech at Arlington National Cemetery, he went and visited one grave and one grave only, and that grave was James Forrestal's grave. So they knew each other. He worked, he covered Forrestal as a reporter for his, um, for Hearst newspapers. So he knew all about this stuff. And I, I'm very convinced, I make this argument in my, my new book, Ancient Aliens and JFK, that Kennedy and Forrestal must have visited the secret German, um, secret German installations where they were actually working on very, very advanced physics, te physics technology, stuff like anti-gravity and the German flying saucers, because they were, in the course of their tours around post-war Germany, they were within less than an hour of that facility at one point. And I'm, I just know that's where he found out about aliens, and it went on from there. Well, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that extraterrestrial te technology has actually infiltrated our own technology. I mean, I think the difference between what is ours and what is theirs, what we came up with and what they came up with, is it's pretty debatable. Uh, it's not debatable at this point to me that that, that actually happened. I mean, you know, people talk about the transistor and that supposedly was given to us by aliens or something we found on a uh, crash flying saucer. And it is true that we were developing transistors too, but we were 10 years away and all of a sudden, boom, we have the transistor because apparently we found it in, in a crash flying saucer, either in Cape Girardeau or Roswell. So there's no question in my mind that there are stuff that has extraterrestrial origins. And in fact, the Germans themselves, some of the German rocket scientists like Hermann Oberth said flat out when they were asked, how did Germany get so advanced? How did you have these jet engines and this advanced propulsion stuff? And he said, well, we had, pe we had help from the people of other worlds. He flatly said that. So, and Mr. Oberth was not any kind of um, jokester. He was an extremely serious man and deadly serious. And he flat out admitted that aliens gave us some of this stuff. The question with Mars and whether pe people can survive there is, is it really what they tell us? Now there are people who have argued that Mars is far more habitable than they let it on. And if you look at things, you look at the sky, for instance, it's actually blue. NASA always makes it look red, but it's actually blue just like the Earth. And there have been temperature readings that have been taken that show that it gets up to 65 degrees Fahrenheit in the summertime. So literally, if you had an oxygen mass to filter out the carbon dioxide, you could probably lay on your back on the Martian surface in the summertime and you'd be totally comfortable in your shirt sleeves. So it seems to me that Mars is probably more habitable than we've been told it is, but there are a lot of reasons why NASA doesn't want us to think that's the case. I think personally it would be very easy to rehabilitate Mars, to rebuild it, rebuild the atmosphere, and um, you know, basically do a terraforming project on, on the planet Mars, which I think it's very important for us to do because you never know when an asteroid's gonna hit and mess things up here on Earth. If we were able to terraform Mars, I think we would begin to evolve. Certainly the Martians would be a little different than us. They'd have to be tougher, probably more robust. The gravity's not as intense on Mars, but it's pretty close. So they would be very compatible with us. So I, you know, I feel like we would begin to evolve into a different way because it's really interesting as you look at at the two planets, you're gonna develop different cultures because everything on Mars is gonna be geared towards survival at first. You know, the, the scarcity of water, of liquid water, is gonna be hard. That's gonna be hard to come by. So that's gonna change your attitude. So I, I expect if we had a Martian base and Martian civilizations that we would find that those guys were tougher than us really, really quick. I mean, I think we have it pretty good here on Earth, to tell you the truth.
Well, the, the evidence that there's been previous civilizations on Mars is just overwhelming. I mean, if you look at, at photographs that have been taken, images that have been taken by the different probes that have been sent, you see evidence of roads, bridges, pyramids, buildings. There's a large sculpture of a face on Mars, which looks like a human face, and it has structural um, elements to it that are just not explainable by natural processes. So you're basically dealing with a planet that clearly had a massive planet-wide civilization before the great catastrophe that destroyed, you know, ripped off half the atmosphere and destroyed most of the civilization there that is, is clearly very, very advanced, probably more advanced than even we are today. And the question is, you know, what happened to them and why did it happen? That's what we have to find out. And I, I think I know the answer, but I'm not sure people are ready to hear it. On the question of whether there's anything that's happened in the news lately that will impact society significantly, I think there is. And I think what it is is these videos that have been released from the Defense Department of what people are calling UFOs. Now, I'm, I'm an aerospace engineer. I'm looking at these things. I'm seeing conventional aircraft. I'm seeing drones. I'm seeing countermeasures. I'm seeing things that can be explained. But what's important is not what's on the videos. What's important is how they're being characterized by the federal government itself. And I think that this is the beginning. It's a setup to what they're going to eventually start showing us, which I think is going to lead up to the revelation of videos they actually do have of really unusual, un unidentified flying objects. So I think that's where we're headed, and that's obviously going to have a big impact on people, at least in terms of they're going to get more used to the idea that there might be aliens among us, and that seems to be what the government wants for us to have. There are many things that have shocked me. Um, <laughs> the most amazing one was a guy slid a, a big print, a big like 11 by 17 print under my door at, a, at, at this conference one year. And I woke up in the morning and there it was on my floor and I picked it up and I looked at it and it was an image of what appears to be a 65 foot tall, for want of a better term, cat standing on Mars. And I think it was a sculpture. It was a sculpture of some kind, but it is undeniably got this feline head, feline ears, little arms. It looks like he's playing air guitar and it's like the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen. And I did go back and confirm it's really there. It's really on Mars. And I have no idea what that is or what it represents, but it is clearly some sort of monument to some kind of cat god or something. And all around it is all ruined, but it, it's amazing. And I, I have no idea what that thing is, but I just, I, I was like, wow, that's really, that's really bizarre. All I can tell you is I'm not saying it's a sculpture of a cat playing air guitar on Mars but it looks exactly like a sculpture of a cat playing air guitar on Mars. That's my only answer to people who question me on it. That you have to remember is that once you accept the reality, and I have many years ago, that there is a sculpture of a human face that's a mile wide and a mile and a half long on Mars. Once you say, okay, I believe that, then you can't say, oh, I'm not gonna believe this to anything else. I mean, you have to be open to every possibility and, and you know, God only knows what's really up there. It could be really incredible stuff and very different. I suspect that the truth when we get it is going to be so different than our expectations that we're going to be really weirded out by it. But that makes sense too because any alien life is going to have a completely different thought process and a completely different approach to everything and so we should expect it to be weirder than we can even imagine. I think we're getting very well conditioned to the idea of alien life and alien thought process but it, it, it's going to be difficult to adapt because if we actually do make communication, there was a great movie a couple years ago, Arrival, that was like that. How do we develop this cross communication because they may communicate in a very different way than we do and it may be extremely uncomfortable for us and if that's the case then many of us may choose they don't want to deal with it. Others may choose to interact with these aliens. And I don't know, it's going to make everything really, really different. And I, I just feel like we're going to be shocked at the things that we find out. Well, I currently have a new book coming out called Ancient Aliens and JFK, which kind of ties in JFK's involvement with aliens and extraterrestrials and the fact that he started the Apollo program, which I think was a sort of a public measure to go to the moon. I'm gonna to go to the moon, I'm gonna bring back the technology that's been left over by the ancient alien civilization on the moon, and then we're gonna reverse engineer our own stuff and make our own flying saucers. And that was a huge threat to the national security deep state. And when he said, on top of that, I'm gonna share whatever we find there with the Russians, that was when they decided he had to go. And it's pretty clearly documented by the new documents that have come out on the JFK assassination that were recently declassified by President Trump. So, you know, I think that that is the most important thing that's going on right now. And I, I mean, I know I haven't even begun to touch the surface 
of what's in those documents. I'm sure there's a lot more stuff in there that, that we're gonna be shocked and amazed by when we see it. My theory on what happened to Mars is that they had a very advanced civilization. And I think the Martians that were original, originally there were very similar to us. They were human or humanoid. And they built machines that became too smart. And I believe very firmly that there was a war between their machines and the original Martians. And what happened was, as part of that process, the planet that Mars was orbiting, because Mars was not a planet originally, it was a moon, was destroyed in that process. And that devastated Mars. The survivors, the very few that were there, moved underground, and there's a lot of evidence showing their underground civilization. And they held out as long as they could on Mars. And when that became really uninhabitable, they eventually moved on to Earth. It's, there's a lot of interesting facts to support this. I mean, for instance, we have body rhythms, right? Circadian rhythms that are linked to a 24-hour time cycle. So we sleep and we wake during a 24-hour period. When human beings go into orbit, their actual circadian rhythm shifts to 24.9 hours, which is the exact orbital period of a single day on Mars. And that indicates that our DNA is kind of Martian, that there's something deep inside of us that's connected to the, to the red planet and we don't really know what it is. And I think that's also where the myths and the legends about Mars being the, the god of war and the planet of war came from, because I really do think there was a war there. And whatever that beautiful advanced civilization was, was pretty much devastated by it. Well, I think it's been, I think it's been withheld. I think NASA, I mean, there's ways you can tell that Mars is a, was a moon and not a planet. It, there's, it's got what's called tidal bulges. And when a planet or object like the moon orbits the Earth, it's in a tidal lock condition, meaning that it shows us the same face at all times. When that happens, you get these gravitational bulges on the, on the center of the planet at the, at the waistline, basically. And one is bigger and one is smaller, 180 degrees around, and Mars has those. So that's proof right there that Mars was actually orbiting another planet. And I think that there used to be three habitable planets in this solar system. There used to be the outer Earth, which was Mars, the inner Earth, which was Venus, and the middle Earth, which is this one. And now we're the only one left. So I think it's imperative for us to discover what happened to, the, to those other two Earths, how they were lost, how those gardens of Eden were destroyed to make sure it doesn't happen to this one too.